Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Professor Robert Norton. Hello, Robert. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm great, Robert. So I read your piece, The Myth of the Counter-Enlightenment, and I am just surprised that it's not more famous. It's a fascinating piece, and I have very high standards, Robert. I don't speak to fools. But yes, your, your excellent piece is not more famous, Robert. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm going to share it with our audience in a PDF form, but I'm going to hit the ground running by asking direct questions. What was the Enlightenment? <laughs> uh, that's a very big question. You can uh, be brief. You can be brief. <laughs> well, we typically think of the Enlightenment as a period in mainly European uh, culture and civilization uh, that stretches from somewhere around the middle of the 17th century and continues to the end of the 18th century. It's characterized by the desire to use human reason as opposed to traditional authorities to uncover the truths about the natural and the spiritual world. All right. What was the counter-enlightenment? Well, as I argue in the piece, uh, that phrase, the counter-enlightenment, was largely an invention, or certainly the popularization of that phrase, the counter-enlightenment, was the uh, achievement, I, I think it was a dubious achievement, of a um, British, uh, naturalized British philosopher, um, intellectual historian by the name of Isaiah Berlin, Sir Isaiah Berlin, uh, who died in uh, 1997. Uh, Berlin was a Latvian uh, Jew uh, who moved to England in the 1920s and uh, went to a university at Oxford and also became a, a don at Oxford. The term counter-enlightenment was his invention to characterize what he thought was a, in particular, German reaction to the dominant stream of Enlightenment thought or what he took to be Enlightenment thought. Um, and uh, he, that is by Isaiah Berlin, characterized the supposed uh, counter-Enlightenment as one that was hostile to reason, to uh, a purely intellectual attempt to understand the world. And uh, ultimately, Berlin's intention was to link this supposed counter-Enlightenment to later cultural and political developments, especially in Germany at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that led to, uh, in Germany, fascism and Nazism. And I vigorously contest that view. And I also say that that view is one that he adopted without telling his readers uh, that this was the case uh, from German uh, scholars and intellectuals themselves from the early uh, 20th century and the late 19th century who wanted to legitimize their own views of the past, especially of the 18th century, by uh, retrospectively reinterpreting the 18th century as leading up to themselves. All right. So I'm going to read a, a brief excerpt from your opening paragraph. Mm -hmm. The West in the Eyes of Its Enemies by Ian Baruma and Avishai Pargalit and Civilization and Its Enemies by Lee Harris. Both books argue essentially that the original sources of contemporary hostility to the collective abstraction called the West are much older than Al-Qaeda or the Jamal Islami, Is, Islamia and have a broader geographical base than Asia or the Middle East. Are you saying that they arrived at this conclusion by reading the works of Isaiah Berlin or because Isaiah Berlin popularized the notion of the counter-enlightenment? Uh, certainly the, the latter and very possibly the former. That is, uh, the, the, and I, I argue this in the, in the essay, that Isaiah Berlin popularized the notion of the counter-enlightenment. Um, and Isaiah Berlin's books have been very um, popular. Yeah, been very popular, and they continue to be so. He continues to be mentioned in um, in you know the press, uh, in scholarly journals, in scholarly books, and you know one of the points of the essay that I wrote. And by the way, that's not the only longer essay I've written about Isaiah Berlin. I have also an unpublished essay that uh, goes uh, more deeply into Isaiah Berlin's own intellectual formation, which I show how he. Um, I think both unconsciously and consciously uh, um, uh, 
uh, adopted a, a, a German intellectual perspective that he then, in essence, translated into uh, a, an Anglophone medium. But I, I do think that, um, that his views, especially concerning Herder um, and also Herder's friend, uh, Haman, have been extraordinarily influential. Um, you know, one problem is that Herder's works, uh, the complete edition of Herder's works is, is in 33 volumes. Each one of those volumes is at least 500 pages long uh, in very difficult German. And there are very few people who, or not native Germans, who are able to read Herder's uh, works uh, in the original. And so they, they have to rely on secondary sources. And since Isaiah Berlin is one of the most famous readers and interpreters of Herder, he tends to be the place that people go to. Isaiah Berlin is a fascinating character, but yes. Robert, I like this article because you're basically making the point that the counter enlightenment, this movement was also built on reason. If you're going to critique the enlightenment, one ought to employ reason. So in a strange sense, the counter enlightenment was just a different form of the enlightenment. I like that. I think that's a, that's a, plausible argument. Uh, and, and there's always a problem with uh, people who, I mean, there's a problem with irrationalism in general, I think that you point, point to that is in order to make an argument, you have to use reason. And certainly there are arguments that are employed. Uh, and, and much later as well. I mean, I, I, as, I, as I mentioned, um, the opposition to a, I would say, distorted um, notion of what the Enlightenment was, especially in its French guys, uh, arose in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, primarily along, along cultural nationalist uh, grounds in Germany. That is, Germany only became a unified state in 1871, and uh, immediately thereafter, many scholars and intellectuals um, began to consolidate the cultural inheritance of Germany in the way that the German state had been consolidated. And one of the most frequently, one of the most frequent motifs in that effort was to um, distinguish or attempt to distinguish a German cultural uh, heritage that was distinct from uh, the French one. And the French, uh, French culture was, was characterized as highly rational, somewhat effete, very cosmopolitan, etc. Whereas the German, uh, German culture was characterized as uh, indigenous, uh, rooted in its place in, in the in the place of Germany um, as one that was not uh, entirely rational, but also uh, drew upon the inner emotional resources of the individual person, et cetera. And, and this polemic um, uh, became more shrill uh, as the First World War approached. And, um, and, and it turned into many, many of, many of the, the streams that were informing this debate also then uh, emerged in what was the most important philosophical movement of the early 20th century, namely the philosophy of life. And the philosophy of life was the attempt to try to envision a way of understanding being that wasn't principally focused on uh, rationality or reason, but rather on the totality of life, the, the lived experience uh, that we all uh, have as human beings, as living beings. Um, and this was called the philosophy of life. It, it wasn't a school, but it was a movement and it wasn't just restricted to Germany. And I think, I think that really was one of the major um, sources for this reinterpretation of the 18th century in Germany, as opposed to especially France, right? So, but you're right, that is, uh, in order to make these arguments, a, a great deal of rationality had to be employed. A great, uh, one has to marshal arguments, one has to uh, provide evidence, and those are all, of course, highly rational acts. Acute response. Professor Norton, I like this, sen this not sentiment, I like this statement uttered in your article. It's, it's, it is in relation to Isaiah Berlin. How much can we really trust his works? And he write, first of all, Berlin rarely analyzes a single work by an individual writer, including Amman, at length or in any detail. That's right. Well, I think if you look at any, any of uh, Berlin's works, uh, you'll find that to be true. Uh, the most he gives us are uh, brief quotations, sometimes an entire sentence, but that's already rare. 
Um, and really what Berlin does is he um, gives what he obviously wants us to think are synopses or summaries of these thinkers uh, works. Um, but really what they are are highly tendentious characterizations that conform to Berlin's own preconceived notions, right? And so um, I think the absence of a sustained analysis, a truly scholarly analysis of uh, any work is already a sign that, um, that, you know, there's something odd going on. And I think that any then closer examination, as I give a couple of examples of in the, art, in the article, uh, shows very often that not only um, is the, are the arguments that Berlin makes, uh, as I say, tendentious, but actually uh, false. If you actually look at the texts uh, themselves that he purports to be discussing, very often they contradict what it is that he says about them. Yes, by reading your article, we develop a more nuanced appreciation of the perceived counter-enlightenment thinkers. So for example, in your article, you, you contend that Amon wanted to reconcile revelation with fate. And these are my own words, my interpretation. I could be wrong, but based on my reading of your article, this is what is being conveyed to me, and it could be conveyed to other people. You, you write, but Amon, Amon wanted to preserve a balance between reason and revelation, making it possible for fate and understanding to complement rather than to negate each other. Yes, that's right. And, and I think that's, that is an accurate description of what Haman uh, was about. Um, uh, Haman was a, a deeply religious uh, person, but he was also an extraordinarily uh, learned person. I mentioned the number of languages that he learned. He uh, obviously knew Greek and, and Latin, but he also learned Hebrew. Uh, he knew Arabic, uh, the modern European languages. And he was interested in language. He was interested in language uh, as such, but also uh, in the change uh, in language over time. Uh, he, the philosophy of language was a major topic uh, for 18th century philosophers. Haman was very much attuned to the debates that were going on at the time. Rousseau himself, of course, famously uh, wrote about the uh, origin of language. Uh, that was something that both Haman and Herder wrote extensively about. Um, but uh, Herder too was a was he was a he was a minister he was a he was a Lutheran minister and uh, thought of himself as a man of God and you know whereas in the 20th century these these things seem to be complete completely irreconcilable this was not the case for many 18th century thinkers and um, and as I as I write very briefly um, this was certainly also the case with Haman. Exactly my point. So, for example, cultural relativism is quite popular in some quarters in the academy today. And you write, Aman thesis rested on the conviction that all truth is particular, never general. That reason is impotent to demonstrate the existence of anything and is instrument and and is an instrument only for conveniently classifying and arranging data in patterns to which nothing in reality corresponds. These arguments are not unusual. They are deployed by postmodernist writers, by Christians, and by cultural relativists. So why, so why are they different when we're talking about people like Herder and Amman? Uh, well, I think that they recognized, and many Enlightenment thinkers also recognize this, that human reason is limited, right? I mean, the, the great- David uh, Hume. David Hume, but also David Hume's, and in fact, all of the 18th century's teacher, uh, John Locke. John Locke taught us that um, reason is fallible. Also, John Locke was was uh, very focused on language and showed that the language was very fallible in many in many re respects. Um, and so, uh, and and of course, you know, the great Immanuel Kant uh, was um, uh, known for having shown us what the limits of human reason are. Right. So. It's not, it's not um, necessarily the case that if we are um, skeptical, you mentioned Hume, about the, uh, the ultimate abilities of human reason, that it necessarily means that we fall into a, an abject relativism or nihilism. That's not the case. And for Haman and Herder in particular, uh, I think what they felt, um, as it were, protected them from uh, that kind of uh, absolute relativism, and certainly not nihilism, as a nihilism doesn't, doesn't occur in their, in their thought uh, as a danger to themselves, was precisely their faith, their, their, their Christian belief. Um, 
they believed in an ultimate truth. They believed in an ultimate uh, authority, and they certainly didn't uh, overestimate the powers of, uh, of human beings. Exactly, and I'm going to read another excerpt. And the, you're citing Ber Berlin. Er Erther maintained that values were not universal. Every human society, every people, indeed every age and civilization possesses its own unique ideals, standards, way of living, and thought and action. There are no immut immutable, universal, eternal rules or criteria of judgment in terms of, of which different cultures and nations can be graded in some single order of excellent. Again, a view that's quite poignant and not unusual. If you think about the cultural relativists like Boas and his team, these views are quite consistent. And Joseph Henrich has a new book oh, titled Weird. And the main theme of this book is that Western culture is different from other cultures. So again, when we really scrutinize the writings of Erther, he's not that extreme. No, he no, he's not. He's not extreme, and I and I think again, uh, I, I can't remember the passage you just read. Whether that's a quotation from Isaiah Berlin, I think it is. Um, uh, you know, Berlin, I think, always uh, tried to uh, insist that uh, Herder had a um, a, um, an, a quite extreme uh, pluralist uh, conception, um, and it is true that Herder. Uh, was extremely attentive to the historical and cultural differences that uh, characterized people across uh, the globe and throughout time. However, uh, Herder was also an Enlightenment thinker in that he remained committed to certain universal principles. And Herder, from the very beginning of his career uh, until the end of his career, um, insisted that there was, despite all of the variation that is evident, again, across cultures and through time, there were, there were um, certain constant uh, values and there were certainly the, the constant of humanity. That is, uh, human beings are different, but they're all human beings. And, um, you know, and again, this can also be uh, very much linked up to Herder's uh, religious belief. And this is the biggest joke in your <laughs> article. This is the bitter atmosphere in, in which Herder writes. I am not here to think, but to feel, to live. Where did Berlin get this from? Tell us. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's very funny, precisely because, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, as, as, I, as I write, um, Berlin doesn't really um, explicate any particular work uh, at any length, uh, but he does give footnotes in some of his essays. And so um, when I looked at the footnote for this phrase, um, it was in one of the later volumes uh, in the collected works of Herder that I mentioned earlier. I think it was volume 31 or 32. And that struck me as odd because Herder's most important uh, works are in the early uh, volumes of, of the collected works. And so I went to the library and looked it up and it's a volume of Herder's poems. And that phrase um, that apparently that, Herder, uh, that Isaiah Berlin wants us to believe is the, the key to Herder's thought uh, occurs in a poem uh, and are the words of a firefly. Um, and, uh, and yes, the joke is that uh, the, apparently the quintessence of Herder's thought is the soliloquy of, a, of an insect. Yes, you're right. Counter-enlightenment comes, it turns out, from the soliloquy of a self-effacing self insect. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. So, uh, you know, that is a joke, but I also meant the serious uh, aspect of that joke, of course, is to show that um, we should be very skeptical about Berlin's own scholarship, right? I mean, at the very least, that would be an example of careless or even sloppy uh, handling of source material. And if that occurred in the essay of an undergraduate student of mine, would cause that student to get a, a pretty low grade, I would say it would, it would be not higher than a C. Well, you're being quite nice <laughs> because yeah. if you're citing work from poetry to adduce academic arguments you're not a serious student or a serious scholar well that is my ultimate point and i think i, I make that rather forcefully um you know i i do think that isaiah berlin had many um positive qualities i mean he certainly uh, had a lot of energy uh, he certainly was very learned there's no question about that um, 
But I think that uh, that there's something extremely odd going on in his entire oeuvre, and certainly in the works that he devoted to German thinkers, of, especially of the 18th century. And you know, to to be a slightly speculative on on my part, I think that um, Berlin was traumatized, as all people were in his of his generation and later by the rise of totalitarianisms in the 20th century. And he was trying to look for the origins of those movements. And Berlin, like many other people besides, looked to the 18th century for the roots of uh, those political catastrophes and, and cultural catastrophes. And he thought he found them in figures like Haman and Herder. I think he was wrong. I think that he um, fell victim to a misinterpretation that he unthinkingly or perhaps even, let's say, cynically uh, appropriated in his, in his own that was actually German in origin, as I say, from the early 20th century. Now we're going to talk about human nature. Obviously, okay. people are different. I am not going to argue that human nature is fixed, but as humans, we have certain correlates. So, for example, we have a desire for social status, Property rights are evident in even quite simplistic societies. So again, Erther has been misinterpreted, and I'm going to read what you have written. You, human nature always rem remains the same. In the 10,000th year of the world, he is born with passions, just as he was, as he was born with passions in the second one. The belief in the basic uniformity of human nature was, of course, a commonplace during the Enlightenment. Okay, then, Professor. So why are some arguing that the views of Herder on human nature are peculiar? Uh, you know, I could answer very um, offhandedly and very quickly by saying that people have not studied Herder carefully enough. And as I say, there are reasons for that. Um, you know, there aren't that many people who aren't, for example, professional, professional Germanists or native speakers of German who are able to read uh, Herder's works in the original. That seems like a really simple um, thing, and it is a simple thing um, as a fact, but, um, but it remains a fact. And so I think, you know, I, I think that people who very confidently, and by the way, this, it's, this is something I've discovered over the course of my career now over 30 years, that there are people, scholars, authors, who very confidently talk about author, other authors and books that they haven't really read, right? Yes, people do it um, all the time. Let me make a quick point. So for example, it is quite obvious, German is not my first language. I like German philosophy, but can I pronounce those words? No, I cannot. I need to brush up on my German. But it's right. quite obvious that when most people comment on German philosophers, philosophers, they are not only misinterpreting primary sources, but it is evident that they did not read the books and they did they even read book reviews. It's quite obvious. Right. And I, 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 that's, that seems like a really sad uh, commentary. It almost seems unbelievable, um, but it's true. And again, I've, I've encountered this in many, many other contexts where, you know, I will read something in an, an article or a book and it will sound very strange to me. Um, and uh, I will then go back to the source, and indeed, um, it, it, it's either the opposite or simply just completely made up. And um, you know, to be serious, um, that is a complete abdication of one's scholarly responsibility. It's a it's a violation, I would even say, of scholarly virtue. Right? We we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the materials. We owe it to our readers. To be as sure as possible that um, that what we are saying about whatever it may be is grounded in in facts and grounded in uh, evidence. And uh, this primary responsibility seems to be one that too many people uh, don't take seriously. Exactly. No, you're going to inform some of these people by talking about humanity. How do you pronounce that word? How is it pronounced? You say in German, you say humanität. Humanität. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, you know that's that's a it's a it's a it's a loan word in German, right? There's a there's a German word for that, Menschlichkeit. Um, but I think the very fact that Herder any any devoted entire book to his ideas about humanity 
uh, using that word humanität as opposed to the German word Menschlichkeit. And I think the reason that, I mean, that's a, it's a word that's derived from Latin. Uh, and, uh, and I think Herder used that word precisely to underscore its universal validity. In other words, uh, he, the, just by using that word, he was trying to um, express the fact that the phenomenon that he was discussing was, uh, was a, a universal one. And uh, his object was to um, elucidate certain basic elements that make up our common humanity and show that despite the fact that it is realized uh, in multiple, uh, in fact, innumerable ways, um, there still remains this core that we can identify as belonging to us all. No, Robert, I'm going to list the shocker and people are going to wonder, is this really from Herder? And it is from his book, Journal of My Travels. What a great theme to show that in order to be what one should be, one needs to be neither Jew, nor Arab, nor Greek, nor savage, nor pilgrim, but rather only the enlightened, informed, in, in, informed, fine, rational, educated, virtuous, appreciative human being that God demands at our stage of culture. Wow. Right. And so there you have it, right? That comes directly from Herder. Uh, uh, and I think that that sentence that you just read uh, would stand as a repudiation of almost all that Isaiah Berlin wrote about Herder. <laughs> but the last point is really crucial. You human being that God demands at our stage of culture. It it, assume, it it seems that he's alluding to cultural evolutionary processes and stages. So, for example, in the past, scholars often argued that humans develop different stages of culture and intellectual develop culture and intellectual achievement. So maybe he's saying that people achieve what they're culture permits them to produce? Well, you know, again, as you say, it was a common theme in the 18th century to think about people did, I mean, the 18th century was really the discovery of, of history as a, as, a, as a way of encountering the world, uh, history in a, in a way that we would recognize uh, today. And, uh, you know, people obviously were, were aware of change over time and uh, people tried to account for those changes. Why, why did they occur? Um, and Herder was throughout his entire career sensitive to that issue. So yeah, obviously uh, there, there is um, development, there is evolution. Um, I think where the difference comes in is in the assumption that, for example, within Europe, that, um, I mean, and there were think thinkers and there remain thinkers to, to imagine that somehow Europe itself represented the pinnacle of human potential. Herder did not believe that. Uh, Herder was uh, Herder did believe, though, that um, you know obviously Europe had developed over the two thousand years of its recorded uh, existence. That is, the various cultures of Europe, including what what I mean, there was no Germany at the time, the German lands, um, and uh, and he tried to account for those developments and understand what they meant and understand what preceded them. And just as he tried to account for developments that happened in other places in the world and at earlier times. Um, but I think what he meant by that, that is that God demands that our stage of cultural development is where we are now in this enlightened century. And Herder would talk about his time as the enlightened century. Um, we still have certain obligations as demanded by God, as he just said in that statement that you read, um, that are incumbent upon us, given the fact that we have achieved a certain amount of self-consciousness and self-reflection and so on. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's important to stress that Herder did not believe and certainly was not saying that somehow his own culture or the cultures of Europe uh, had somehow uh, achieved a, a higher pinnacle than those elsewhere or in earlier times. Correct. But then again, I, I, I'm not a cultural relativist. I believe that cultures developed at, a, at varying stages and not all cultures are equal. And some people 
when introduced to a different cultural practice that's more pragmatic, they may change. But then again, this is only my view supported by some data and old studies. Now we're going to talk about his views on passion. Would you describe him as a romantic? No, I would not describe him as a romantic. I, I prefer, I mean, first of all, we have to ask ourselves and say what we think romantic means. Exactly. Uh, I, I prefer to, and, and a lot, by the way, a lot of confusion has been created by the use of this word. And, and there has been, there was, has been an interpretive tradition um, that uh, has seen Herder as a precursor to, or as a major influence on German Romanticism. German Romanticism really begins uh, in any recognizable way in the mid 1790s uh, in the city of uh, Jena. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I actually do not believe that Herder uh, had a significant influence on German Romanticism. In fact, if you look at the figures that we associate with uh, the origins of, of German Romanticism, principally the Schlegel brothers, Friedrich Schlegel and August Wilhelm Schlegel, um, or Novalis, uh, these people were all Kantians, uh, and they were in Jena, um, really out of their interest in, in Kant, and there was a very important group of people there who were promulgating Kant's thought, um, and uh, in his, the later part of Herder's career, he published two very vigorous critiques of Kantian philosophy. Uh, he published a uh, Herder published a critique of uh, Kant's first critique of pure reason, uh, called a meta critique of the critique of pure reason, and uh, that was followed by a critique of Kant's, Kant's third critique, uh, the critique of judgment, which Herder called the Caligone. Um, I've also written about, especially the the second piece, um, and I I believe that the you know commentary on that uh, on that work by Herder is has often been. Um, misguided. Uh, but the point is that, that Herder was seen as an antagonist of Kant, which is in the last part of his life, in, in the 1790s. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that, that it's, and many of the romantics never mentioned Herder. I mean, if, if he was such an important influence on them, you would think that they would talk about him, and they don't. Um, but I think the reason that Herder has often been associated with romanticism or has himself been seen as romantic is precisely because of his misidentification as an irrationalist, right? I mean, the romantics themselves were, let's say, skeptical about certain elements of the Enlightenment project, right? They rediscovered religion as an important cultural and individual um, uh, experience and phenomenon. Um, they, I mean, the romantics were famously interested in the night and the various aspects of the night that um, uh, that resonate uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I but I think that uh, again, it's this kind of retrospective reading and the the search for precursors that has caused people to think that somehow Herder was uh, an early romantic or a proto romantic or something of that sort. And I think that's wrong. Maybe they mistakenly assume that he was an advocate of feeling over reason. Well, Herder was a, an advocate of feeling. He, he thought a lot about uh, feeling. In fact, uh, one of his works, uh, he wrote a, an entire treatise on sculpture uh, that came out in 17, uh, uh, 1778 uh, called Plastik, which is just the German word for sculpture in which he uh, argued that our understanding of sculpture comes primarily through our sense of feeling. And in general, I mean, he also wrote another essay called On Sensibility, in which he thought about, uh, he, he deeply thought about the, the role of uh, feeling sensibility in not just the cognitive uh, process, but uh, in, in our engagement with the world more broadly. So yes, of course he thought about feeling, but he didn't, uh, uh, say or think that um, feeling somehow supplanted reason or was superior to reason uh, or something of that sort. But he certainly, I mean, of course, feeling was extremely important to him. I mean, he was a, he was a, a very attentive reader uh, of, uh, we already mentioned Hume, of all of the British empiricists, the sentimentalists. He read uh, Francis Hutcheson. Of course, he read Locke. Um, but also he read the French um, uh, em empirical philosophers. Condillac was a very, very important uh, uh, source for, for Herder, as were other 
uh, French uh, uh, empiricists or sen sensualist philosophers, as we call them. But he is correct. Without feelings, we cannot reason. Look at, look at the case of Kentucky, for example. You eat Kentucky because it's appealing. You like the allure of the food or the aroma. That's why you're buying Kentucky or McDonald's. Even if though we, you even though you should you, you even though you know you should not. <laughs> yes, with, with, without feelings, we cannot reason. And this is aided by empirical data. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of that academic Antonio Damasi. Oh, yes, I know Antonio Damasio. Mm -hmm. Yes, without feeling, we, we can't reason. So again, he seems to be quite prescient. I think Heather was right about a great many things. Uh, and, and that's, you know, uh, a larger intention of my work on Herder has been to free him of these- Salvage his reputation. That's right, salvage his reputation, free him from these misrepresentations, from these misinterpretations. And to show that um, you know he wasn't some you know strange freak, but rather someone who, uh, as you say, um, got a lot of things right, uh, and and maybe even as you say as well was prescient, right? Someone who uh, was a little bit ahead of his time in some significant ways. Um, but again, I mean, the fundamental issue remains: in order for people to really understand that, they have to read Herder himself, and in order to do that, you either have to have extremely reliable translations and more translations have been appearing over the last couple of decades, but uh, all of his works have not been translated. Um, uh, or you submit yourself to uh, 10 or 15 years of learning German so that you can read Herder in the original. Like you. I, <laughs> I love German scholars. I don't know why, but I'm so fascinated by German. They're, they're really brilliant. If I were not a Jamaican, I would want to be German, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that I'm going to be white. I'm okay with being black. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, but I would definitely be a German. I just find them so appealing and cognitively rich. Yes, well, I, I consider it one of the great gifts of my life that I uh, that I have access to that world, to that intellectual world, and to that culture, and uh, and I owe it uh, all to my early studies of the German language and having been in Germany. And uh... Robert, you yes. said that other critique Immanuel Kant. Why? Well, you know, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, Herder believed that um, that that Kant had gotten some really basic things about how we human beings um, think and act wrong. And uh, I think it was an act of I mean, whether you agree with Herder in the end or not about his particular uh, critiques of Kantian philosophy, I think it was an act of considerable bravery, uh, in fact, to um, to publish, you know, two very lengthy works that um, that subjected Kantian philosophy to a bracing critique um, at the time that he did, because Kant's uh, Kant's star was rising very steeply at that time. He was uh, the, quickly seen to be the most important philosopher, not just in Germany but in uh, in Europe, in the world, and um, and also there were personal connections between Herder and Kant. Uh, Herder had studied with Kant in Königsberg when he was a student at the university. Um, so he was not just attacking a cultural icon, but he, and, and again, the most important philosopher of the time, but he's also attacking uh, someone who had a personal connection to him. And so I, I think it is a sign of his intellectual independence and courage um, that he did it. Again, apart from the, the fact, apart from the question of whether he was ultimately right or wrong. Now, I think that elements of Herder's critique deserve to be taken very, very seriously. And I also think, uh, in particular, uh, in regard to Herder's critique of the critique of judgment, uh, Kant's third critique, that um, they're not actually that far apart. In other words, in, let's say in the question of the autonomy, both of uh, judgment and of, uh, of beauty and, and of art, I actually think that they largely uh, concur uh, but they come to their um, they come to their conclusions in very different ways, and I think Herder. I mean, we, meant, we were talking about feeling and sensibility before. I think Herder thought that Kant um, was too much of a rationalist; that he didn't take um, uh, feeling and, and sensibility seriously enough. And you know, Herder, um, you know, he was he was interested in everything. Um, wanted to take as many phenomena into account as possible when trying to account for something. 
And when uh, Herder thought about, let's say, the aesthetic um, experience, he wanted to be as generous and possible as possible in uh, understanding that aesthetic experience in its totality. And he felt that Kant's account was very desiccated, very dry, very rationalistic, and um, really not um, uh, not really reflective of the reality of our of our experience when we, for example, experience beauty. So you know, I'm not sure that Herder was wrong. Uh, let's put it yeah, that way. It appears that he was a sucker in man. He appreciated sentiment. I I think he did appreciate sentiment. I mean, he was a he was a he was himself a very passionate person, uh, and uh, in fact, you know, he had a he had a great friendship with Goethe um, that came to an end because uh, Goethe simply, you know, couldn't um, uh, couldn't condone Herder's emotional outbursts anymore at a certain point. I mean, Herder I think did become somewhat disappointed in, in the later part of his life. He had been extremely famous. Uh, Herder had been extremely famous in the early part of his career. And he, he, his fame diminished over time uh, toward the end of the 18th century. And I think he did become bitter. And that bitterness often expressed itself in, you know, very violent outbursts against various people. And, and Goethe just couldn't stand that anymore. But that's a sign of, I think, of, of, a, of a very strongly feeling soul, right? I, I, uh, I think that that's a, an, an expression of Herder's own, as it were, passion. Exactly. Now we're going to get to the meat of the matter. Are we confusing Herder with German scholars like Willem? I can't pronounce his last name. D-I-L-T-H-E-Y, although I'm quite familiar with his research. Uh, Wilhelm Dilthe is how you Yes, yes. Dilthe. Are we yeah. conflating the work of Herder with people like Willem? Mm. So I think that was the argument I was trying to make earlier. That is <clears throat> that um, toward the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there arose a, uh, a, uh, a school of interpretation of the German intellectual tradition um, that uh, was um, looking for antecedents to bolster their own uh, views. And so I, I do believe actually that um, we are confusing Herder with his later interpreter's thought. Yes. Yes, the, the, these people who wanted to create a unique form of German nationalism that was distinct from French culture. Exactly right. Yeah. Yes. It, and, and, and this is one of the reasons why I like your paper. So many brilliant snippets. And I read it and I say, all right then, people should be familiar with this line of research. So why am I not seeing these articles in the New York <laughs> Times? Well, you know, actually that, um, that article, the, this article that you're, that you're uh, referring to has been actually quite widely read, relatively speaking, uh, and that's important to say, relatively speaking. But there was, a, um, there was a review in the New York Review of Books about uh, a year and a half ago or so uh, by Anthony Appiah on a book uh, uh, about the European Enlightenment. And he, he cited this article and, and, and said, you know, uh, for an alternate view of Berlin in particular, but also of the whole notion of the counter enlightenment, see my article. So, you know, people have been referring to it in prominent places and, and uh, you know, that's not the New York Times, but after all, it is a New York Review of Books, which is not bad. And it's yeah, it's a good a publication, but Kwame Anthony Apaya referred to your article when a year ago, and this article is pretty old by our uh, standards. That's right. That's right. So I guess what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I, I think it, it has been read by a lot of people. And as we can see, it, it has been you know, mentioned in some prominent places. But, um, you know, I, I think to fully uh, appreciate the I think there are two there are two reasons why this line of thinking has not been as prominent as it I think it should be. And one is to fully appreciate um, the 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 implications of, of the argument that I'm making, you also have to not just know, you know, Herder and Haman and, and many of these texts in the 18th century we've been discussing, but also you need to read Diltai and Diltai too is very difficult to read. There are a lot of, there's a lot of materials to read, 10 volumes of uh, difficult German. 
Um, you need to, to read other scholarship uh, that was produced that was very influential in the early 20th century in German and so on. And, and that's simply a, a insurmountable barrier for a lot of people. And the, yes. second, and, and the second reason I think is that, um, you know, this is related a little bit to what we were saying earlier about people not reading uh, texts that they comment on. And that is, you know, people have a lot invested in certain interpretive schemas, right? Uh, that is, we think we know what happened uh, in the past, and we build our own interpretive models based upon what it is that we think we know. And if we if we encounter a line of thinking that fundamentally contradicts those interpretive schemas, then it takes an enormous amount of integrity um, and, um, I don't know, uh, tolerance for risk to say, okay, I am going to call into question, and let's say we're talking about a, a scholar in the middle point of his or her career, I'm going to call into question everything that I thought I knew about this subject, and I'm going to consider the possibility that it's wrong. Now, scientists, natural scientists do this all the time. Uh, humanists do this far too too infrequently, right? I think that is people, I think uh, social scientists and humanists um, are not as ready to call into question fundamental assumptions they have about any number of things. And so I think, I think that is also an obstacle to, um, you know, either perceiving or accepting the line of argument that I presented in that article. Yeah, so for, so for instance, Delta is actually a contradictory thinker if you're not, incis if you're not incisive. So for, so for instance, Delta critique knowledge, but his critique of knowledge should not be construed as a critique of science. Now, I, 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 that's, a, that's a perceptive thing to say. And, and Delta himself is a very uh, complex thinker. Um, and, uh, you know, he, Diltai um, never really achieved a full systematic expression of what his project was. He left that to his, to his students and his disciples. Um, so you have, to, you have to approach Diltai's thought and also his works um, uh, from, a, from a very, um, let's say... Objective level. Well, one hopes objective, but um, but really making sense of what Diltai was all about is not an easy task in itself. Not at all. And we're going to speak about another interesting character. His name is Rudolf Unger. Is it Unger? That's right. That's yes, right. Rudolf Unger. Tell us about him. Uh, well, he um, was a scholar of the a German literary scholar of the early 20th century, and he um, uh, his, his, his major work was a, was a four volume history of German literature that tried to um, explain uh, individual authors and their works uh, on the basis of the place where they lived and worked. Uh, in other words, uh, he really did believe that, um, that the, the immediate cultural, uh, even uh, physical environment in which one lived uh, significantly determined um, the character of the work that one produced. One can see um, how that way of, of thinking um, had, had deep roots, but um, Unger uh, injected this with a kind of a, a national cultural chauvinism uh, that, um, that made his conclusions uh, at the very least debatable, let's put it that way. Yes, and Isaiah Ber Berlin relied heavily on Unger's work he did indeed yes yeah yes as as it as it is written the final goal of enlightenment intellectualism is the most complete rationalization of the world of life religion and art strictly logical abstract abstract thinking and all of the sciences that rest on it the exact study of nature mathematics and speculative conceptual philosophy assume control of intellectual life and dialectically seek to decompose, negate, or eliminate everything, everything, everything that is dark and irrational by sub, by submitting it to the calculating, measuring, appraising, understanding. Yeah, and so that, that's a that's a highly characteristic passage from this is from Unger's book on Haman, and that's a highly characteristic passage. Um, 
uh, in which, uh, and you notice there that, that Unger doesn't actually cite anyone. Um, these are all, um, uh, this is a description that comes only from Unger, but we're meant to, to believe that this is uh, representative of the thought, especially of the French Enlightenment thinkers. And you can see the, the affinity that that passage has with many of the things that Isaiah Berlin says about the Enlightenment. And, and the point I wanted to make about that passage is that decomposing uh, um, uh, uh, tendency that Unger thought he identified in, uh, in the French Enlightenment often was attributed to Jews, uh, especially in the early 20th century. And so there is a unspoken, but I think um, audible uh, anti-Semitic component in that. But I'm listening to Unger's assertion and his critique sounds elegant and it's not necessarily inaccurate. So for example, in the 21st century, we reside in a mechanical age. The cost-benefit analysis model is quite popular in, eco in, economics, in, in economics. And then there's also the model of Cass Sunstein, what he calls libertarian paternalism. And this is also quite mechanical and scientific. So uh, Unger is not necessarily incorrect. We live in a world that is fond of mechanization and data. Well, that, that would lead us into, into an entirely different direction. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with what you said. Um, where I would disagree is, uh, where, where is, is that an accurate description of the 18th century and 18th century thinkers, right? In other words, you might be making a uh, systematic uh, judgment and uh, you know, the critique of technology um, is a very important one. We could talk about Heidegger and other later figures. Um, and certainly we live in a highly mechanized data-driven world now. But uh, if you're trying to make an historical argument, and that's the point I'm making, um, then we have to look at things a little bit more closely, right? Uh, if we're, if we're talking about uh, a, a phenomenon in and of itself, that's one thing, but if we're trying to say that this also characterized you know, the life and thought of people who lived 200 years ago, then that's something else. Yeah, that would be anachronistic. And again, more than likely, Un Unger was not predicting the advent of the internet. He was not. I don't, I don't imagine that he foresaw that, no. Yeah, but, but if... However, if we are projecting our modern sensibilities onto the ideas of people like Unger, they seem a bit reasonable. I don't, I don't actually think, uh, well, you know. It, depend, Unger, it, it, it depends on your radius of rationality. If you're just reading the statement with an objective mind divorced from politics and, sens and sentiments. You know, I, I think you're making a good point. I, 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 I do want to try to be intellectually generous to Unger. Clearly, he, um, you know, he was an intelligent person uh, who uh, was insightful about uh, about things. Uh, his book also was, you know, widely read and I think fairly influential. Uh, so we we can't discount him altogether. Um, I I also think that he um, did manage to see um, maybe even partly foresee certain uh, aspects of modern life. I mean, again, this book came out in 1911. And to anyone who was paying attention, it was clear that uh, there was an increased pace of life, there was an increased mechanization of life, there was an increased uh, dehumanization, uh, especially of European life. And I think Unger was very attentive to that. Where I, where I object is in projecting, I mean, in other words, we could, we could even say, we could even again, speculative, um, speculatively imagine that what Unger was doing was, uh, was analyzing the modern world, but then projecting back this, this frame of reference onto the 18th century, also as a way of trying to explain where we in 1911 came from, right? And so I think that, um, you know, part of what was driving uh, Unger's book was a, was a very sensitive awareness of what was going on in the time that he was writing. But, uh, but it was actually very unhistorical in that he was projecting you know, current experiences back onto the middle of the 18th century. I, I agree with you. You don't want to paint Unger as a saint. That's okay. But what's quite interesting is, is that totalitarian ideologies tend to be premised on rationality. They're more that likely to invoke rationality than sentiment. Sentiment is, is often employed to legitimate authority. So if we're being honest, ideologies 
that have been inspired by rationality and rationality was inspired by enlightenment thought, many of these ideologies can be a bit totalitarian. So maybe Unger was on to something. I think I think Unger was either on to something or he was riding the wave of something. Uh, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think, you know, what one of the things that makes, uh, for example, Nazism so national socialism so difficult uh, for people to understand is that it was on the one hand, uh, indeed, uh, a, a movement, uh, a phenomenon that uh, was at the very cutting edge of modernity, highly technologically sophisticated, um, you know, based on mass organization, uh, on um, efficiency, etc. But it also was um, very reactionary and uh, emotion driven and uh, consciously uh, dependent upon myth, right, uh, and and uh, uh, exploited myth uh, in order to pursue and promote its agenda. So there are these two we think of normally as contradictory elements that were central to um, to national socialism, and uh, and I think we always have to think of them together. Robert, it appears that our ideas comport. We're in sync, so maybe we should write a paper together. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I, I, I do have to go. Uh, so uh, I've enjoyed my conversation. Yeah, with I'm you. planning to wrap up too. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, and I, I don't know what you're planning to do with all of this, but, uh, but I, I hope the conversation has been helpful. You clearly uh, have a wide range of reference uh, yourself. And uh, I, I, you're clearly a, a very intelligent and informed person. That's always, it's always nice to talk to a person like that. That's why academics love me. They can't read this match, but they always say yes. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. I, I can see why. Um, All right. So, but bye. And we, yeah. Speak, yeah, we speak again. Very good. Well, the All best right, of luck then. to you. Bye. Yeah, bye.